Okay, I think it's time to start. Hello, everyone. My name is Megan Jeffrey. I am the Outreach Manager for the University of Washington Department of Communication. I'd like to welcome you to this CJMD Spotlight featuring Dr. Kathleen Beckers. I want to first begin by reading a land acknowledgement from the University of Washington. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Now I'd like to introduce you all to Patricia Moy. Patricia Moy is a political communication scholar who focuses on communication and citizenship, specifically how mediated and interpersonal communication can shape public opinion, citizens' social and political trust, and political behavior. Her research addresses communication content, processes, and effects across myriad issues in multiple continents. Patricia, would you like to introduce our fabulous speaker today? Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for today's, uh, for our CJMD Spotlight. It's really heartening to see such a great turnout. As Megan mentioned, uh, this talk is sponsored by the Center for Journalism, Media, and Democracy, which brings together individuals, scholars, practitioners who are interested in how information practices, media cultures, and core democratic values intersect. Our Spotlight today features Dr. Kathleen Beckers, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Political Science at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. She earned her bachelor's and master's at the University of Leuven, both in communication studies, then moved over to the University of Antwerp, where she earned an advanced master's of international relations and diplomacy, as well as her doctorate in communication studies. Dr. Becker's research interests focus on journalism, public opinion, and content diversity, and her studies have been published in a broad swath of journals. These include, most recently, the European Journal of Communication, the Journal of um, Journal, Journalism and Mass Communication Quarterly, Journalism Studies, Journalism, and Digital Journalism. Funded by Research Foundation Flanders, Dr. Becker's research has gained incredible traction in that her findings and her calls to action have led to policy recommendations, to parliamentary questions and debates, and to the creation of journalistic guidelines. Thanks to a fellowship from the Belgian American Educational Foundation, Kathleen spent 2020 as a visiting scholar at the University of Washington and in her apartment in Ballard, where she conducted research on the representation of public opinion in US news media. Today, she's here to share with us part of that research. So on behalf of the CJMD and the Department of Communication, please welcome Dr. Kathleen Beckers for her spotlight presentation titled the voice of the people in the news, public opinion, US broadcast news. Okay, hey, thank you, Patricia, for that nice uh, introduction. Uh, can I just start? Yes. My presentation? Okay. Um, first of all, thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, it's, not, it's evening for me, but still morning uh, for you. So as Patricia already mentioned, I am Kathleen Beckers. I'm a researcher from the University of Antwerp in Belgium, but I have spent uh, 2020 as a visiting uh, scholar at the University of Washington in Seattle, mostly indeed from my apartment in Ballard, as Patricia uh, mentioned. Today, uh, I want to talk a bit about uh, some of the research that I've conducted while being in the United States. Uh, and that was mostly a project on how public opinion is uh, represented in uh, US broadcast news with a specific focus on the 2020 US elections. The next slide. So the starting point uh, for this project uh, was actually in 2016. So in June 2016, um, the UK voted to leave uh, the European Union in the Brexit referendum. And later that year, Donald Trump was elected as US president. And, uh, both events, the outcome of both events took mainstream uh, journalists, journalists working for mainstream media by surprise. So um, after the election of Trump, uh, there came a period of um, intense, um, where um, journalists came under intense scrutiny. There was a lot of criticism of journalists and there was a long period of self-reflection. And uh, here are some headlines uh, from that period. Uh, for instance, uh, from the New York Times, how did the media, how did we get this wrong? Brexit and failure of journalism from the Atlantic, 
how the media's election predictions badly missed their mark. So why is uh, how public opinion is represented in the news media so important? Well, in the first place, because representing public opinion is one of the main functions of journalism in democracies. It lamely conveys something about the topics a society thinks uh, are important. It tells something about the salience of issue in a society, but it also tells something about what people in a society think about politics, for instance. And both citizens and elites uh, rely on the news media to learn about public opinion. On the one hand, citizens look at the media to see what others in their population think about a specific issue, and when later forming their own judgments or opinions on that issue, they take into account those perceptions of what public opinion is, which over time might even influence behaviors such as voting behavior. Elites, on the other hand, uh, politicians, for instance, they turn to the media to see which policies have public support and which don't, for instance. So how journalists portray public opinion can be quite consequential. So note that the public opinion I'm talking about today is mediated public opinion, and per its mere existence, this is a simplification of reality. Because of course, uh, in reality, public opinion is a very uh, complex thing. It's often very nuanced. It's a dynamic thing. It changes all the time. But for journalists to be able to represent it, they need to interpret it, summarize it, and simplify it in one way or another. And uh, broadly speaking, there are five ways in which journalists can represent uh, public opinion in their news items. The first uh, one are opinion polls, which is probably what most of you think about when thinking about public opinion. Those are surveys with uh, citizens' barrier uh, questions about a specific topic. Secondly, there are general inferences to public opinion, which are broad uh, generalizing statements, often unsubstantiated and without any supporting evidence about public opinion. Examples are, for instance, statements such as the people are angry or the Americans do not agree with the policy. Thirdly, there are Fox talks, which are interviews with ordinary people on the street, giving their opinion on a specific topic when interviewed about that, often on a shopping street or in a train station, for instance. The fourth category are protests, which are probably the most active display of public opinion, uh, because uh, here citizens very actively go out to the street uh, or sign a petition, for instance, to convey their opinion on a specific topic. And lastly, there's a fifth category, a more recent one, uh, which are social media references, uh, which I operationalize as all references to public opinion that are based on social media information. Examples are, for instance, statements such as um, it rained angry Facebook comments or everyone on Twitter was angry. So broadly speaking, there are two um, research questions in my projects. The first one being when do news media portray public opinion and when they portray public opinion, how do they do it? So uh, I said in the beginning that I was mostly going to talk about election news, which is probably what most of you are most interested in. Uh, but before doing that, I first want to talk a bit about public opinion in US routine news, uh, which I had the chance to study uh, because of a global pandemic and me spending a lot of time uh, working from home uh, in Seattle. So uh, what I did here was together uh, with Megan Dahl, a graduate student from the Department of Communication of the University of Washington, uh, we've conducted a content analysis of 1,577 news items uh, for, based on constructed news weeks from the year 2019. Uh, and we consider 2019 as a routine year in the sense that there were no midterm or presidential elections in this year. And the news items originated from the three main uh, evening news broadcasts, which are CBS Evening News, NBC Night News, and ABC World News Tonight. So for the results, uh, the first thing we found that was um, that actually there are quite large differences between the three broadcasters. So on NBC, uh, one out of four news items uh, portrays public opinion in one way or another. While on ABC, for instance, this is only 11% of the news items. Secondly, we find that topic is an important predictor of the presence of a public opinion uh, portrayal in a news item, with public opinion being uh, represented more often in political news as compared to all other news. This is, of course, not really surprising as public opinion plays a really central role in democratic uh, politics. Um, you would expect that 
um, in politics, uh, politicians always try to make their policies congruent with what the public wants. Um, but next, we were most interested in how they uh, represent public opinion in day-to-day um, -day news. And what we find here uh, was interesting. So uh, this graph displays the share of the different uh, types of public opinion portrayals we've talked about before. And the first thing that stands out is that more than half of all portrayals of public opinion in the news are those general unsubstantiated inferences to public opinion. So where the source of the information is unknown. The second thing that's interesting is that protests make up, make up one out of five uh, references to public opinion in the news. Well, this is interesting because a similar study uh, was conducted by colleagues from the UK back in 2001, and they found that protests were the least common public opinion display, around 4% of all public opinion displays. So in the past 20 years, it seemed that protests uh, received more attention. Uh, and the third thing I want to highlight here is actually the absence of opinion polls in this graph. So opinion polls, at least in routine news, are the least frequent way in which journalists uh, portray public opinion. And this is quite striking, given the attention they receive in public debate. As you saw in the headlines I showed on the first slide, most of them talk, to, talk about uh, polls in one way or another. Uh, and also in academic research, polls receive a lot of attention compared to all of these other public opinion portrayals. So, we're talking about public opinion here, so of course it's always interesting to think about, okay, how diverse are those opinions that are presented in the news? As I mentioned before, in reality, public opinion on most topics is quite nuanced. There are often uh, different opinions uh, present in society, and do journalists present this uh, diversity? Um, the answer is uh, no. So, um, 90% of all news items that represent the public opinion in one way or another presented only one point of view. So most of the time, public opinion was presented as being rather unified uh, on a topic. And I have some uh, examples that will clarify uh, what we did exactly. So um, here is an example from a news item that was broadcast on January 11 on NBC. Uh, it's a new item on sexual assault allegations against the artist Art Kelly. Uh, and the news item starts uh, with the news anchor uh, making an inference, stating, Kelly has come under fire after the docuseries Surviving Art Kelly. This is followed by, by two references to different protests, both against Art Kelly, and the news item ends uh, with a social media reference, stating, while a deafening outcry to hashtag mute Art Kelly floods social media. So based on this news item, you would assume that public opinion on uh, R. Kelly is quite unified. Actually, most of the people uh, have the same opinion on this topic. Uh, however, in reality, the story is a bit more nuanced. Um, as probably there were still some people uh, supporting R. Kelly at that time, and also uh, a large group of people who think uh, they should await the trial, and that, of course, he's innocent until uh, proven guilty in this case. Another news item that does show a more nuanced image of public opinion is from May 2019 from ABC. Uh, this news item covers uh, the governor of Alabama signing a new stricter abortion bill uh, into law. And this news item shows both protests uh, in favor of the bill as well as against the bill. So this news item provides uh, more diverse viewpoints present in society compared to the previous uh, news item. But um, these were the results for routine news. I wanted to provide them today because they provide a nice base rate of what day-to-day -day news looks like, because of course, elections are very different from routine news periods. And there are some interesting difference, uh, differences I will highlight uh, later. So um, for election news, um, I again did a really similar content analysis as the one I described before, but this time I coded all news items uh, from the period uh, from Labor Day, September 7, until the day before the elections, uh, November 2nd, 2020. Um, so I coded the uh, uh, entire last two months of the election campaign, uh, often seen as the most intense uh, campaign period. I was here interested mostly in election news specifically, and I operationalized election news as all news items uh, that referred explicitly to the uh, 2020 US elections on November 3rd. Again, the news item originated from CBS Evening News, NBC Nightly News, and ABC World News Tonight. 
As I said, I will mostly zoom in on uh, election news, but I did want to show you the difference between uh, non-election news and election news in this two-month uh, period. So um, for non-election news in blue, between 90% and 27% of those non-election news items refer to public opinion in one way or another, which is really similar to the results I found uh, for routine news uh, before. But very striking is that in election news, between 62 and 76% of all news items refer to public opinion in one way or another, which really shows how central the role of public opinion representation in the news is during the elections. So um, for the remainder of the presentation, I will focus on those news items that are represented here by the red bars. So again, I looked at uh, how public opinion was represented here. And the first thing that stands out probably is that there is a sixth category uh, of public opinion representation now. So at the bottom, uh, there are campaign interactions, which are also the most common public opinion portrayal in election news. Uh, so campaign interactions are all um, images of really explicit support for a specific political candidate. So for instance, uh, campaign rallies, people waving a Trump flag, people having a Biden-Harris uh, sign up in their front yard. Um, because they, these are very uh, active and explicit, explicit uh, displays of support for a specific political candidate. Uh, and this is something that is really typical for the US election uh, campaign. I also studied uh, Belgium election news, for instance, and we don't have these campaign events or rallies uh, at all. So they also aren't covered uh, during the elections. But uh, in the US, they make up 42% uh, of all public opinion representations. And I will tell a little bit more about that later. Another thing um, that's interesting in this graph is that suddenly opinion polls are more prominent. So in election news, they make up one out of five public opinion uh, portrayals which again might not be super surprising because of course uh, the format of an opinion poll fits very nicely with what uh, election results uh, look like. Uh, and the third thing I want to highlight here is, um, well, the relative absence uh, of both general inferences to public opinion as well as protests, which we saw were most common in routine news, but it seems uh, that the way in which journalists portray public opinion shifts between uh, routine news periods and uh, election news. So I, here I'm going to take a different um, way of studying it than in the routine news study. I was here interested mostly in how journalists constructed public opinion specifically on the topic of the US elections. Um, so what I did here was for every public opinion uh, display, I coded whether it was uh, whether it was linked specifically to the election outcome. So whether it either showed support for Donald Trump with regards to the elections, support to Joe Biden with regards to the elections, or no specific uh, pref preference. And this results in the following graph. So uh, this graph, uh, this place, for every different type of public opinion displays, the share of those who either show uh, Trump support in red, Biden support in blue, or uh, no specific preference when the case falls a toss up in gray. So when we start by looking at the results for polls on the left, we see that the overwhelming majority of uh, opinion polls that were reported in the past in the last two months, and there were a lot of polls, um, showed support for Joe Biden. So the outcome of the poll and the way the journalists interpreted the poll result was in favor of Joe Biden. Only 6% of the polls that were reported on had uh, Trump as a winner of the poll. What is interesting is when we look at the second category of public opinion portrayals, which are campaign interactions. And these convey a completely opposite image of uh, American public opinion as compared to the poll information. For the campaign interactions, I found that uh, the large majority actually showed images of people supporting Trump. For the Fox Pops and the general inferences of public opinion made by journalists, I again found that they mostly uh, portrayed uh, public opinion beings in support of Joe uh, Biden. But I will show some examples that will clarify what that looked like uh, exactly. So I will start uh, by discussing the opinion polls a bit more uh, in depth. And what I did here was look how this evolved throughout the campaign period, because it might have been that there are some changes 
uh, as election day uh, nears, which is what some previous studies found, is that the news becomes more balanced as election day comes closer. So this graph uh, displays on a daily basis uh, the share of either uh, polls reporting Biden as being ahead in blue, Trump as being ahead in red, and um, a toss up. Um, and the journals explicitly framed the poll as being a toss up in uh, gray. And what we see here is that in the first half of, the, um, of these two months, actually, um, there are many polls reporting Biden support, but also still many polls that uh, represent a toss up. However, as the campaign um, nears election day, we see that the lines move apart a little bit, and that actually in the final month of the campaign, uh, there are no days in which uh, the majority of polls did not report Biden as the winner, which might not be really surprising because, of course, in the end he won. Um, but there were still, as you saw in the last days, polls that had um, Donald Trump as a winner. Uh, this also includes state polls, by the way. So these are all polls that are covered in the news. Uh, so there are, of course, still polls that were unclear or where uh, uh, Trump was still um, the winner. So then for the campaign interactions, I first want to show some results of what I uh, saw as campaign interactions. On the Trump side, you had, for instance, those large uh, Trump rallies where people very actively go uh, outside in support of Donald Trump, go to these events to show that they support uh, Trump. Here are some other images, people waving signs, uh, cheering, chanting, people standing next to the street with Trump flags, again, very actively showing support for Donald Trump. And lastly, also still uh, images of uh, people showing up for Trump. On the Biden side, of course, we didn't have those large in-person rallies because of the pandemic, uh, but there were a lot of uh, drive-in events that are um, visualized here. Also, people holding up Biden signs, um, the typical uh, yard signs people put up in their front yard in support of Biden or Trump, and then also uh, comparable images to the Trump flag, people standing next to the street with a Biden flag. As we saw before, the large majority of those campaign interactions showed uh, Trump's support. And here again, I was interested in how this evolved throughout the campaign period. And this again gives an interesting graph. So this graph again on a daily basis represents the uh, total share of uh, campaign events either being in support of Trump uh, in red or in support of Biden uh, in blue. And what we see here is that during the first half of this two month period, so in the month of September, the majority of those campaign events, and even the overwhelming majority, uh, displayed uh, Trump support. Uh, and this might partly be explained by uh, what happened in reality, because of course, uh, during the entire month of September, Biden didn't host any in person event, not even drive in events, uh, because of the global pandemic, while Trump, of course, already did his large uh, rallies. However, even by the end of the campaign, we do see that the lines move closer together and that more Biden events are covered as, the, as uh, election day nears. However, throughout the entire two month period, there are only two days in which more uh, events in support of Biden or people uh, explicitly supporting Joe Biden in those campaign interactions. Um, there are only two days in which those were more uh, shown more frequently for Joe Biden than for Donald Trump. Even in the last week of the campaign, there was no single day in which uh, Joe Biden received more attention uh, than Donald Trump in this regard. Then uh, for the Fox Pops, I wanted to show some examples. Um, to be able to compare the Fox Pops with the other uh, to the other uh, the past two public opinion displays, so campaign interactions and polls, which often are very clearly either in support of Trump, either in support of Joe Biden. Uh, the Fox Pops often were a bit more nuanced, and I also quoted them in more detail. So what I did here uh, was for the Biden support, I took together both people who made a statement either supporting Biden or a statement against Trump. And for the uh, Trump support, I quoted uh, people together who were either uh, favoring uh, Donald Trump, made a positive, state, positive, positive statement about him, or who made a negative statement about uh, Joe Biden. So some examples. An example of a person on the street who made a positive statement about Biden is, um, I truly feel that Biden cares about our country and our people and he'll do the right thing. Uh, and then an example of a negative Trump statement is, I just don't want to vote for Trump. And I have to note here that on the pro-Biden side, most of the statements were actually uh, 
anti-Trump statement more than uh, pro-Biden statements. On the uh, Trump support side for the Vox Pop, uh, typical uh, anti-Biden statements were um, statements such as, I work in oil and gas, so what Biden and Harris have said is very scary. Um, and then a positive Trump statement would be something like, Trump makes promises and he delivers. But here again, most of the Fox Fox that were interviewed and made it into the news actually uh, displayed uh, support for Joe Biden, either by making positive statements about him or negative statements about uh, Trump. And then uh, lastly, for the general inferences made by journalists, again, most of them were in favor of uh, Joe Biden. Now, here are two examples on the slide. Um, here is a statement made by the journalist stating, but Biden also trying to boost lagging support among key voting groups. And I have to note here, there was no other information provided around this statement. So there was also no poll information uh, shown on screen, for instance. So as an audience member, it's impossible to know what information this journalist based this statement on. There's no way you can verify where uh, the journalist got the information. And the second statement uh, is one from ABC World News Tonight stating there's no doubt that there's a lot of enthusiasm in Florida for Donald Trump. So quite a strong statement made by the journalist. Again, there's no way uh, as a member of the audience you can verify this information and know uh, why the journalist made that statement and what information uh, it was based on. So this shows um, how these uh, general inferences that are um, not as common in election news as we run with two news, but still uh, quite prevalent. Um, in uh, election news. Um, I don't have any results for the protest specifically because I coded these um, public opinion portrayals uh, with regards to the elections quite strictly. Um, so there were very few protests that explicitly uh, went about the election uh, outcomes. So there were some protests, for instance, against um, uh, or that were uh, talking about the new Supreme Court justice, but I didn't quote those as uh, talking specifically about the election outcome because you were talking about the broader election, but not specifically about the outcome. So um, in the end, I am uh, also, of course, really interested in how journalists portray public opinion overall, because I looked at all these different uh, public opinion portrayals, but I um, also looked at how the combination of all these uh, public opinion portrayals construct an uncertain image of uh, US public opinion on the elections. Here again, uh, on a daily basis, I coded the sheriff uh, all different uh, public opinion portrayals that were either pro-Trump, pro-Biden, or had no specific uh, preference. And what we see here is that by the end of the campaigns, the lines are actually really close together. So the amount of attention uh, pro-Biden public opinion received as uh, compared to what uh, pro-Trump public opinion received was actually relatively uh, similar. So if you would look only, for instance, at poll results, which is what often happens in uh, public opinion research, you would get a skewed um, view of what public opinion representation in the news uh, looked like. Well, actually, the polls were very um, one-sided in a way, but by combining all these different public opinion displays, it becomes a more nuanced image of uh, public opinion. So um, to conclude, I start this presentation by stating uh, the importance of representing public opinion in uh, journalism. But the question one has to ask is, by uh, representing and reflecting public opinion, to what extent uh, do journals also shape public opinion? And especially during elections, uh, this might be quite uh, consequential. Because even when I found that uh, actually in the end, when looking at all those different public opinion portrayals combined, um, there are still quite some big differences between the different types of public opinion portrayals. Uh, and some of those public opinion portrayals are very explicit in their goal and are probably also very deliberately used by journalists as a way to represent public opinion. For instance, when an audience member sees an opinion poll, they know that it's a measurement of public opinion and the journalist also intended it to be uh, a measurement or a representation of public opinion. However, for these campaign interactions, it's, mu it's much more implicit that it's a, a representation or a display of uh, public opinion. However, these images are quite strong, very vivid, uh, so it might be that you actually have uh, quite a large influence on how the audience perceives public support for a specific uh, candidate, for instance. And overall, 
Uh, specifically for routine use, where we saw that those general inferences to public opinion were really prevalent. Um, it seems that journalists uh, seem to start from an idea they have of what the majority of the people think about a specific topic, and th that is the opinion that they uh, represent in a news item. However, previous research has shown that journalists are actually not that good at reading public opinion, so this might lead to misrepresentations of public opinion in the news, which might then uh, lead to misperceptions uh, among the audience. Uh, I'm going to end with this. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Um, so we do have a few questions showing up in the chat. Uh, the first one is from Russell William Hansen. Russell William Hansen, would you like to read your question? Hi, Kathleen. Um, I loved your presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so uh, the question that I have concerns um, the percentage of opinion polling that was reported um, for support for each candidate. And I was just curious whether you knew or kind of like had an intuition about how the extent to which that tracks like the percentage of actual polling um, that should, showed support, right? Whether there's a disconnect between um, the percentage that's being reported in support for each candidate um, and like how many reputable polls are actually showing that support? Yeah, that's a really good uh, question. Also an interesting question. Um, most of the polls that were reported on were actually, um, or very vague references to polls where there was no way to know what uh, the polls like. So statements such as the polls show that Biden is doing really well. And actually most of the other polls were the uh, broadcasters own polls. So they all have their own polls sometimes together with newspapers, uh, for instance. Uh, and it's, it's, of course, the case that only the polls um, of the swing states make it into the news most of the time, right? There are polls of uh, states that will for sure be red or like Washington state that will for sure be blue. Those polls don't make it into the news. Um, so that might, of course, screw the results. Of course, in the end, Biden also won the election. Um, but it's still quite interesting to see. Um, I didn't discuss it here, how off the polls were, how much they overestimated or some predicted a win for Biden in the, in the swing state that he didn't win in the end, for instance, or that they predicted a really big win while it was actually really close um, in the end. Um, and what they also did was often um, call Biden as a winner of the poll, while actually the result was within the margin of error. So actually you couldn't, uh, call Biden a secure winner. So I look, what I did here was look at how they framed the poll results. So how they talked about the poll, like Biden is winning in the polls. Sometimes it was uh, 49 versus 50%, for instance, only, and then it was within the margin of error that I coded how they framed uh, the poll results. Uh, so in a way, I think, because of course Biden won, most of the polls turned out to be in the right direction in the end. Um, but yeah, it could have went the other way too, I guess. Thanks. I, I think it's super illuminating um, to hear your explanation. Thanks. If I may ask a follow-up question that's directly related to Russell's. Um, so, Kathleen, you were talking about journalists reporting these uh, margins of errors around specific uh, data points. To what extent did you find, and I know you probably didn't code for these items, but to what extent did you find or recall seeing uh, legitimate polls being reported in a scientific manner. And I say this in terms of having journalists provide information about the margin of error, about the sample size, instead of just saying the recent polls showed. Yeah, that's actually, I did quote that actually. So that's, uh, I have something to say about that. Um, so first thing I have to say is that more than half of all references to polls were those broad, diffuse uh, references to polls, where they just said the polls say that uh, Biden is ahead. Uh, and then uh, specifically when they referred to their own polls, they actually um, showed the margin of error quite frequently on screen. If I'm not mistaken, it was around 68%. They often do it in very small letters somewhere uh, on the bottom of the screen. They often don't pay any more attention to it. There were three polls. Uh, I, that I recall, yeah, three or four in total, where the journalists said, well, the results are within the margin of error, while most of the time they uh, were very close. Um, 
but the margin of error is, uh, funnily enough, one of the only uh, methodological information we give. They often give the date of the data collection, but nothing about the sample, for instance. Did they reference the type of data collected, an online survey, a... No, never. Okay. Thank you. We have a question from Megan Dahl to everyone. Megan. Just to Kathleen. Um, good presentation, Kathleen. I, my question is just with respect to the, the additional category in the election news. And I'm curious if you could speak more to the type of reporting that accompanied sort of the really um, vibrant Trump rally images, uh, for example. I'm curious if, I don't know if you quoted for this, but if in general the reporter the reporter or journalist talking about it, if they if there's any sort of valence to their commentary or if it was just like pretty neutral reporting that a rally occurred. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Unfortunately, I didn't uh, quote that. It would have, I thought afterwards it would have been really interesting uh, because I think it's really interesting how frequently they show uh, pay attention to those Trump uh, events, um, which might be caused partly because they're very newsworthy events, right? Journalists like to show them because they're very, um, like their imagery is, is very nice. So people typically um, actually link to Donald Trump. Those are very, at least from a European perspective, very typical images of Donald Trump, like being at a rally. Um, but it wasn't that, um, that this is based on my general idea about coding. It wasn't that they were super critical of the events. And it was also often that they didn't pay particular event, uh, particular uh, attention to the event. Sometimes just when they were talking about Donald Trump uh, is uh, campaigning, they showed images of campaign events in the background, much more than they did that when talking about Joe Biden, uh, for instance. So that's very interesting. It seems to be some sort of imagery they use to refer to uh, Donald Trump. Of course, there were some references where they were critical of the fact that Donald Trump did in-person events where people weren't masking up uh, during the campaign. So that would have been really interesting. Yeah, I thought about that too afterwards. May I chime in with another question while others formulate theirs? Oh, Matt has a question. Matthew J. Powers to everyone, please. Um, actually, Kathleen, if I can ask two questions, but they'll both be quick. So first, thanks. This is so question one is, to what degree, um, given that you've done research on public opinion in the news beyond the US, to what degree is this specific to the US um, and to the extent that it is why? And then the second sort of bigger picture question is um, like normatively, how should we think about evaluating the results? So in other words, like, is it the mix of results? Like we wanna see a little bit of each kind of, um, you know, the formats for representing public opinion. Is it that we want them to skew closely to the polls? Like what, how, how should we think about evaluating the things that, we, that you find empirically? Yeah, so for the, uh... Country comparison, I think the US is quite a specific uh, case. Like I mentioned, the large focus you have on those campaign interactions, I don't think at least many European, there are many European countries that have those uh, campaign interactions. I know of a previous study that studied in the UK and they found that they made up around 10% of all uh, campaign uh, imageries of public opinion. In Belgium, for instance, we don't know that at all. But the big difference between many of those countries, of course, is that the US has a two party system where there's a very clear, um, yeah, there are only two opinions that are very easy to visualize, for also very strong visual images. In Belgium, for instance, we have a multi party uh, system. So there are seven parties in Flanders alone, then we have federal different levels. It's very complex. Uh, so it's much more different, difficult to represent, uh, well, to, present a simple story. In the US, it's much easier for journalists to present a simple story, to present fox pops on the different um, parties. It's much easier to do that in television news. Uh, but I also found in uh, Belgium specifically that opinion polls do not play such a central role in election news as they do in the US either. I think that's um, what people typically find for the horse race coverage that's really uh, strong in the US. Also the fact that the campaign is highly mediatized which is also not the case in Belgium, for instance. Uh, we don't have those televised debates uh, in Belgium the way you have them in the US. So I think, well, in the US, the campaign is really, really strongly mediatized, much more than in many other countries, I would say. 
Although, for instance, the Brexit campaign in the, US, in the UK also received a lot uh, of attention. So I think it would also be really interesting to study how public opinion was represented uh, there. But that's maybe for another time. Uh, so for the normative uh, aspect, that's a difficult one. Uh, I think I think it's really important, and uh, my research has shown that, that it's important to look further than the polls alone. And there are often the polls that come under scrutiny. Uh, you sometimes start journalists blaming the pollsters. Like, you, you were wrong. We just reported what uh, the polls measured. Um, the polls were off. But in a way, they, of course, also built that image of public opinion through all these different uh, measures. And some of these uh, displays of public opinion, especially the most vivid ones, like uh, much research has found that uh, Vox Pops are, for instance, more influential than poll information. So when you show a Vox Pop next to a poll and they give opposite information, people tend to follow the Vox Pops. Uh, I can imagine, I don't think there's research done on that, that it will be really similar for those campaign events. Uh, also, because people don't always perceive them as a measure of public opinion. So people might be uh, critical about opinion polls. They don't always trust the polls, uh, specifically uh, Trump voters uh, are very critical about poll reporting in the mainstream media. But those Trump uh, images are very strong, right? People get the idea that large crowds show up, are willing to go to a Trump event, support them very openly. Um, so I think those can have a strong effect. So I think it's important that journalists realize that actually they create um, well, public opinion, not only through those polls, but they also actually make a lot of those general uh, inferences about public opinion based on how they interpret uh, what's going on. Um, yeah, so I think that it's really important that journalists are aware of that. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I hear of a question that was directed to me by uh, Alan Kesselman. I'd love to read it. How do we know that the opinions presented in broadcast news is comprehensively or at least accurately representative of the views of the people the news presenter came? Um, well, there's no way uh, to really ever know that. But I think it's impossible for a journalist or for anyone to grasp public opinion as it is because it changes uh, all the time. So it's a really difficult contested concept or even scholars who um, have as a starting point that public opinion does not exist. Um, but I do believe that it's important uh, to represent it in the news media. Uh, and so for instance, in routine news, we saw that 90% of the news item presents only one point of view. Sometimes there were news items that had, uh, eight representations of public opinion, and they all presented the same point of view. Uh, and for some topics, you could say, well, uh, global warming, for instance, why you shouldn't show a Vox Pop that a nice global warming scientists say it's true. Uh, but for many topics, actually, specifically political topics, there are different uh, voices present in society. And I think it's important for journalists to uh, at least show those nuances that are present. May I chime in with my question? I'm sorry, I don't mean to hog the Q&A time. Um, so in relation to Matt's question, Kathleen, in relation, in, in relation to your one of your final slides about how the portrayals of public opinion are consequential. Now, obviously, um, audience members, their information processing and how they perceive the source of the information, these are all critical factors to consider. I was wondering for those of us who are interested in analyzing content, it's one thing to say, okay, this image may have greater impact because of the size, the number of square inches or the number of column inches of an article, but for a news broadcast, what was the average or range of seconds in which an image appeared on the screen? Was it a, a reporter speaking and then there was just a flash of this image of a rally or was it sustained coverage or sustained footage, sustained footage of the rally and then a voiceover? I'm just trying to get a sense of, well, if someone is seeing an article or hearing, hearing, a, art, hearing a story or reading an article with all of these different types of portrayals, you know, yes, Vox Pops are really prominent and they pop in someone's mind, but how are they processing the other things? 
Yeah, that's a really uh, interesting question. I also didn't measure how long uh, things were shown on screen, for instance, or for instance, the campaign rallies, how uh, sometimes they were really short, sometimes there were long reports uh, of people uh, cheering or the Trump speech where people were clearly cheering in the background, holding up uh, Trump signs. Sometimes you had those images of people standing next to the street where they filmed them extensively. Sometimes it were just short images of a pro-Trump yard sign next to a pro-Biden uh, yard sign, for instance. Um, but I think specifically for television news, it might be the vividness of the images. Uh, so the, those general inferences to public opinion, they of course are never shown on screen. They are made uh, quite casually often by journalists. Um, so I think compared to those campaign events, to those Fox Pops, I think the Fox Pops and their vivid images uh, will have a bigger influence. Um, but I think given the fact that uh, so much research found that even in television news, the poll compared to a Fox Pops, that the Fox Pops is more influential because it's such a vivid uh, image. Um, I think the vividness plays a big role so that even a short uh, display of a very strong uh, image of a crowd cheering for Donald Trump, for instance, next to a poll that said, oh, Biden uh, is the winner of this poll with 51%. I think it might be, I'm not 100% sure I haven't tested it, uh, that the campaign images, even if they're very short, might be, convey a strong, quite strong image of public support uh, so that they might be influential. Thank you. What other questions might others have? I do have one final question to close and to look forward. As you know, um, in real time, we are uh, one day out from the Chauvin verdict. How do you think, how do you anticipate journalists will portray public opinion? longitudinally, with what types of portrayals? Uh, you mean on the Black Lives Matter movement? Yeah. Um, well, there were covered quite a lot during the uh, periods of coded, so I've uh, seen quite a lot of them. Uh, I would say um, that actually almost consistently, I think they show uh, a very positive image of the Black Lives Matter movement, often show those images of um, support. Actually, if I recall, a lot of Fox Pops on the topic, people on the street talking about what was going on, more, and actually almost consistently in support of the movement. And I think journalists probably quite deliberately also searched those uh, voices to play a positive role uh, in that movement within that uh, moment. So I think now, uh, when you would look at the news tonight or tomorrow, I think you would see uh, that image of public opinion being very, uh, positive about what happens. Thank you. Oh, yes, please, Megan. Sorry, it's quick and I think it could be ascertained if I had more time with some of the graphs from it, from the presentation, but I'm curious, I was also struck by the difference in relative amount of general inferences between routine news and election news. And I'm curious if the absolute numbers were also that stark or if it was just the relative relative to the polls and stuff, or if in general there was actually like quite fewer general inferences. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, so uh, there were so much more uh, infra, uh, public opinion representations in general and election news and the absolute numbers are really close. Uh, to another, but I wanted to show the relative numbers because I was uh, interested in how do they portray it in different years, what methods do they use uh, specifically to talk about uh, public opinion and show that uh, contrast. But in the papers I'm writing, I also show uh, the absolute numbers and share of news items in which, which they uh, are shown. And then you find, of course, that almost all public opinion representations, with the exception of uh, protests, are more common in uh, election news. Gotcha, thanks. Any final questions for Dr. Beckers at this time?
Uh, Patricia, any closing thoughts from you? No, only to say it's always useful to understand or try to understand a very vexing concept, not just from a conceptual perspective, but from an applied perspective and from an international perspective. It's so easy for us to look at things that are happening within our immediate life spaces that we don't think about how others might view it. And it's the need for the goldfish to leave the fishbowl every so often, but quickly and come back. Thank you, Kathleen. Hey. Yeah, thank you very much for having me and for the questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Beckers. And for those of you who are still on the call, we will have the recording of this available in about one week, and I will be sure to send it out to all of our attendees. Uh, and I will also go through our chat and look at any relevant links or resources and include them in our follow-up email as well. But thank you all for joining us today and another round of applause for our wonderful guest. And thank you to the Center for Journalism, Media and Democracy for um, hosting Dr. Beckers. And we look forward to seeing you at our next events. Everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.